Merry Christmas. And now I can tell my wife that five, six, seven hundred people told me Merry Christmas, okay? <laughs> but thank you all for being here tonight. We hope it's a wonderful service, a wonderful evening, a wonderful morning tomorrow for all of us as we celebrate the birth of Christ. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we praise you for this opportunity we have to worship. And God, tonight, everything is about you. Absolutely everything, Father. And so we give this time to you. We thank you for the opportunity, the love that we can share with each other by being here, Father. As we sing, as we read scripture, Father, the lighting of candles, may they have a very special meaning to us tonight. But Father, above everything, we come around the Lord's table to celebrate the body and blood of Christ. Father, thank you that in the midst of all the hustle and bustle, there can be this quiet, worshipful time within and among the body of Christ. Father, thank you that we're part of the church. We all pray this in Christ's holy and precious name. All of God's people say it. Amen. Let's worship.
We all remember back uh, to BB guns and baby dolls and all in between. And there is more anticipation sitting in this room. And the younger you are, the more there is than maybe there is any other night of the year. But we go back and make it real. And I, I don't propose to ever say anything on uh, New Year's Eve night or Christmas Eve night that's any different than it's ever been said. But I do think if you could stand here and just see this many people coming to worship on a Saturday night before Christmas, you understand the power of God's grace and his love. Because I know you're busy. I know you're tremendously busy. But I want to read just several scriptures tonight, and I want us to grasp them first of all by hearing some of the dates. This, this little nativity scene's one Jill and I own. She's collected them over the years, and I think it's one of my favorite. It's Mary and Joseph, the way it would have been, just Mary and Joseph. And she's holding the Christ child in her hands. And that's what it was all about, but they were unknown people, um, embarrassed people, as we would have said Last week, they were uh, probably pegged with a lot of not kind things being said about them, and I'm sure their own families didn't even believe the story they were telling. And then, in the midst of their poverty, the government forced them to travel, and she gave birth away from the support of, of any of her family. It was not a good time. It was just not a good time. But I want to go back 700 years earlier because Israel, which was 
not in a very good shape, lived as they do today in one of the roughest neighborhoods in all the world, and they were sort of a crossroads from anybody coming out of North Africa into other parts of the world, and they'd go from one captivity to another, one occupying army to another, it seemed like, and yet so many of them kept holding on to faith, to faith, to faith, that that God was going to do something miraculous. They had no idea. Their thoughts were way too small. But they understood that God was going to do something. But you go back to a prophet named Isaiah, 700 years roughly before Jesus was born. 700 years. That's a long time ago. Go back to the 1300s to get a grasp of it. That's how long it had been. And... Uh, he says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And listen to this. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. 700 years earlier. And a lot of people would like to detract and say, well, they just made the story come true. This couple made the story come true? Give me a break. You know, it had been somebody much more important than Mary and Joseph that would have made it come true and it gained some sort of traction. God had to do something. It's 700 years earlier that was spoken. Micah, we call him one of the minor prophets. Uh, they probably don't like that hanging out in heaven. Why do we get pegged as minor prophets? But their books were just shorter than the others. It had nothing to do with the truth of what they said. And Around 700 B.C. also, a few years difference one way or the other, uh, he had written this. He said, marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, talking about this little city, but you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will rule over, who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, of ancient times. In other words, he is older than the earth. He comes from ancient times. He wrote that in 700 B.C., and it's going to happen um, at a day we call Christmas. Jeremiah 23, 5, 600 B.C., so we go back or come forward 100 years, says... The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David, and this has to do with the genealogy, an offspring of David, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and will do what is right in the land. And every one of these, we're talking about Jesus. They didn't know each other. Micah and Isaiah didn't hang around the local uh, Starbucks and say, let's go write a prophecy and it'll come true in seven or 800 years. And boy, won't we? They didn't know each other. They were in different times, different sieges, different captivities, and would write of this hope of something that would happen in the future. New Testament writers said they believed when they'd seen nothing. But it had been the revelation of God in ways you and I can only imagine as God prepared the world. Um, and then this one is uh, talked about in Matthew 2.18, but was first spoken in Jeremiah 31.15. says, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children. It's talking about the Jewish history again. It says, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Rachel weeping for her children. You remember the Christmas story? We usually don't put this in the nativity story. But the wise men came months later at least, maybe two years later, and found Jesus and the king had stopped him and said, oh, you tell me where he is. I want to go worship him too. And it was all a political paranoia. And what he wanted to do was kill this young king. And when they went back another way because of God's revelation, didn't go report to the ruler. He killed every child, every boy, two years and younger to make sure he got Jesus and most scholars will say the area killed was two or three hundred children killed just instantly in brutal ways. Refusing to be comforted because they are no more. It was not just all a beautiful story. It was a horrible story for some. But the glory of God was coming. And I think of those young children who lived two years or less and undoubtedly went to abide with God and in his presence being told, you're here because of Jesus and the glory they must receive because of that. Must be overwhelming. Listen to some of these others. It says he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey's colt, Zechariah 9.9. 9. 
Many years later, Matthew 21 tells us that happened. He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11, 12. All of these are from 500 B.C. back to 1200 B.C. He will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Matthew 26 tells us that story. The money would be used to purchase a field that belonged to a potter. Zechariah 11, 13, that's where Judas went and hanged himself. The Messiah would die a sacrificial death for us all. His reason for coming, 2 Corinthians 5, Daniel 9, 26, Isaiah 53, 8, Matthew 27, 50. I'll talk of this, some prophecy and some say this is what happened. He would die with criminals, but his burial would be with the wealthy. And doesn't that tell us born, impoverished, died with the criminals, and buried with the wealthy, that Jesus died for everybody? We should reach down, up, across, wherever to take the gospel. But that was written in Daniel 9.26 and Isaiah 53.8 and fulfilled hundreds of years later in the telling of the story in Matthew 27.50 and 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, as Paul would tell it. It's absolutely amazing. He would rise from the dead, Psalm 16. Isaiah 53.10 and other places fulfilled in all of the Gospels. Rise from the dead. Absolutely the most hope-filled story that's ever been told. And I think a lot of us sometimes maybe wrestle with the doubt of why don't we see that more often. He told us that would happen. He would be the firstborn from the dead. And it only takes one to prove it can happen. And it happened. And then it says, for all the rest who die in him, there will come a time, there will come a place when we rise from the dead. And that's absolutely some of the most glorious things, written hundreds of years before it happened. He would say certain words from the cross. He would be mocked. People would gamble for his clothes. Told to us in Psalm 22, 1, Psalm 8, Psalm 18. Talks about these things he would say from the cross. And we know them as, as um, seven sayings. The last one being to the criminal, you will be with me in paradise. Why? Because of the faith that he exhibited as he was dying a criminal's death. He deserved death, and he said that. But he said, please remember me when you get into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? I will. You'll be with me. I won't just remember you. You'll be with me. I think some of the hardest words because we would all amen that were friends of Jesus as he would be betrayed by a friend in Psalm 41, 9, and John 13, 18, and other places we read of Judas and his betrayal. It, it's a it's sad story, but it's absolutely an amazing story. Now, what I'd like for us to do now is just think for a minute about the world at the time. Because everything I've said to you, you and I know were fulfilled. But I want you to go in that field with the shepherds. We know their story. They were not out there having church. There was no church. They were doing what they did every day. And it would not have been fun. They were not considered by many to even be clean people. You know why? They probably weren't. They lived a rough life. Shepherd's life is 24-7, 365. There's no PTO. There's no vacation. There's no clothes for the holidays. There's going into briars and brush. There's fighting wolves and everything. It was a difficult life. And I'm sure they all grew up knowing these prophecies. But I bet they did not talk about them a lot. I bet, and I want you to go back 1,200 years ago, 800 A.D. Go back 700 years ago, 1314 uh, 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 A.D., and just start thinking of anything you can even remember that was said by an early church father then. So they kept saying, yeah, he's going to come someday, this Messiah, and he's going to be the good news. I bet they got so sick of hearing that. And I bet the whole countryside was sick of hearing it. Israel was a crossroads. And people came in and betrayed them. They were an occupied country. Uh, people came in and abused them. The Romans at this time had power over them. Why were Mary and Joseph where they were? Because there was a census being taken. Why is a census ever taken? To tax people. 
Why do we take them in the United States every 10 years? To tax people, to know about them, to know who they are, to have a little bit of control. And these were brutal people that controlled them. They didn't count them where they were. You got to go back home. Oh, she's pregnant. I don't care. Get on the donkey and go. And they had to do it. So they lived in a time of very, very little hope. They did not have near the anticipation we have in this room tonight of what tomorrow will bring. They did not have the Lord's Supper to look forward to every week. They did not have memories of any type of resurrection. It was not a beautiful scene in all flowing robes and bright lights. I remember a live nativity scene that we did in Florida one time at a church and people drove through to see it and uh, there were hundreds of people lined up at this large church right off of US-1 coming down the coast and several ministers got together and planned it. We thought it was the greatest idea we'd ever had and we had the live donkeys and all the horses and everything and it was a, one of those horrible Christmases in Florida when the temperature that day had been about 75 and, and <laughs> everybody's driving through and there was a front came through and it got cold and the temperature dropped down, I kid you not, in the 50s. And the news people said, get your pets indoors tonight and it's going to go down, seriously, it's going to go down to the 40s. And we got together at nine o'clock and it's supposed to go to 11 and called it off lest someone get cold. <laughs> Think of what they were living, how we paint the pictures what we have in our mind of the beauty of the manger, it was not. It was not. I don't say that except to prepare us. And I would tell you that what was going on in the midst of that night, the whole world was dark. No hope. Absolutely no hope. Except in God's wisdom, there was a very faint light in a stable. Very faint. And that light began to grow. And God went to those shepherds who had no hope. And the light spread. And they would come and they would worship God. And they would go and tell the story. And months later, the wise men would come to see the child. Led in a very miraculous way by God. And they would go home a different way. But undoubtedly tell the story of what had happened. And that little faint hope would begin to glow from one place to another. Jesus would grow and go to a temple at age 12. And what they would hear in that temple is the language of a child that was smarter than any child that ever lived when it came to knowing the scriptures. And that faint hope would begin to grow. He would teach and ready his apostles. And the church would be birthed some 30 years later. And boy, that was the news spreading on steroids. Look at what Jesus has done. He's back from the grave. Everything he taught us is true. And Jesus would leave us with that one very simple message. Go tell everybody. Go tell them. And they begin to share the story that was born in that little hope in the dark world. And they'd share it one after another. Sharing the news so that the good news would go all over the world. It was a quiet night. 
but everything that had ever happened, every word that had ever been spoken was coming true. The wonderful news of Jesus' birth shared around the world. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Let's all stand.
pray together as we close. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus. Seems that this whole Christmas story is a huge mystery to us, but what you did was make everything so personal. You brought restoration into the world and made it human, and we live that restoration. And faith becomes so personal brokenness becomes so personal because it showed up in a, in a human in human form and it took on flesh and it lived a life and it conquered brokenness and it conquered family issues and it conquered divorce and it conquered war and it brought restoration to the world and that's personal this lie in our hand gives us hope hope came from a helpless child who once grew into the Son of God, mature, human. And Father, we just worship that. We're in awe of that tonight as families and as people of God. So as we leave in silence, we continue our worship. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, He is our Savior. He is our Lord. It's through Him we pray. Amen. As you exit quietly, we ask that you blow your candle out and there will be buckets at each exit door. If you would just kindly place those in there, we would certainly appreciate it. God bless you all. Have a Merry Christmas. You are dismissed.